A goddess cheerfully congratulates Satho for dying. Wait, that doesn't seem right. She offers her condolences instead. Satho seems confused by the situation, and the inexperienced goddess explains that he was hit by a truck and died. Instead of being distraught by his death, Satho is relieved, almost unbelievably so. The goddess begins going over Satho's life through a divine book. She sees no evidence that he committed any misdeeds, and he regularly puts the shopping cart in its rightful place. However, she does notice that he's never acted on any romantic advances. She also learns that when he turned 18, both his parents died in another traffic accident. Their family is just one big truck magnet, unsure. Taking pity on him, the goddess explains that Satha will receive special treatment in his next life. A rich family, a beautiful face, excellent talents, and the added advantage of being able to keep his memory. However, she informs him that he won't be reincarnated on Earth, but into another world. If he happens to reincarnate in the same world as his acquaintances, then he'll be able to reunite with them. Satha leaps up and asks her what happened to his sister, Saya, who also died with him in the traffic accident. The goddess admits that she met his sister beforehand and reincarnated her into the same world. Satho explodes. What the hell was she thinking? Reincarnating him along with that maniac of a sister. Just when he thought he was freed from her insanity, he'll be forced to share the same world as her again. Not even death will grant him relief. He refuses to be reincarnated and runs away endlessly, but there is nothing the goddess can do. The process has already begun. All she can do is offer him a weak apology and hope that he survives. She tells him to hide himself to the best of his ability, and she promises to extend her assistance whenever she can. Slowly, Sotho sinks into the abyss. He is about to be reborn, and he closes his eyes. He wonders if he can escape from his sister in this next life. Satho was locked up by his sister for five whole years. Satho hears a woman's voice coming closer. His vision is still blurry, but he slowly opens his eyes. The housemaid, Anneli, cleans him up after he wets himself, and he learns that he has been reborn as Jack, the only son of the Libra family. Jack has become a baby, and he is currently being changed. All this is a massive burst of information for him. Annie prepares him for feeding, and she picks him up to bring him to his mother. Jack can tell that she is speaking a completely different language, but for some reason, he can understand everything she's saying. He really did reincarnate in another world. Jack feeds on his mother, Madeleine, while his father, Kalam, watches. Kalam complains that Jack already gets to drink on Madeleine, while it took him months to get that far. Madeleine asks him to stop talking about such vulgar things in front of Jack, worried that he might become another certain philanderer and womanizer she happens to love. Madeleine intends to raise Jack right, and they'll live happily ever after. Kalam joins her in watching over their child. Jack is over the moon with happiness. This is exactly what he wanted, a kind, loving family, with no completely unhinged and insane sister in sight. Though worried that he might not be the real Jack, and just a personality inserted inside this newborn baby, he swears to respond to their hope and to their love. He will become Jack. He is Jack Lieber, the first son of Count Cullen in the kingdom of Reyes, and he won't allow this family to end in tragedy like this last one. Later, after being tucked into bed, Jack formulates a battle plan to stay off his sister's radar. All he has to do is hide, run, and stay hidden. This should be a simple matter as long as he doesn't do anything out of the ordinary, such as using his knowledge of modern society to further his goals in the modern world. No heroics, no thief chasing, and certainly no demon slaying. His sister is a force of nature who might find him anyway. He'll need to defend himself just in case she happens to find him. Jack's plan to stay an unassuming boy is thrown out the window when three weeks later, he can suddenly fly. I had to check my notes to make sure I wasn't reading The Incredibles instead. Annie immediately informs his parents, who are astounded that their son, at such an early age, is able to manifest spiritual arts. Even someone as naturally talented as Kalam was only able to use spiritual arts when he was four. For someone as young as Jack, this is exceedingly rare and just as impressive. Colin explains to his months-old son, who can't even talk yet, that there are spirit fragments embedded in their bodies. Naturally, the same is true for Jack, and it is thanks to these spirit fragments that he was able to float in midair. Spiritual power is latent in every citizen of Reyes, but Jack has it in spades. He is, without a doubt, special. Colin decides to personally tutor Jack to hone his talents and use them for the good of the world. Madeline tells him that there's no point saying all this to a baby, but Colin can feel like Jack can understand him. Next, he'll teach him how to deadlift 300 pounds. Jack understands what his father is saying, and he intends to use this power to protect everyone from his sister. If he can't, nobody is safe. Later, Annie takes him to the family library to read some picture books. 
Jack crawls about and slaps his hand on a few covers, and Annie picks them up. She reads him a story titled The Genesis of the King of Spirits. There was once a great king who possessed unparalleled wisdom and was beloved by the spirits. Seeing that the world was empty, the king gradually created and shaped the world with his might, giving birth to existence, the seas and the spirits that govern the elements. The spirits are the world itself, and they are essential for their day-to-day -day lives. Annie demonstrates that she uses the flames of the fire spirit Aeon when she cooks. Humans use the power of spirits to sustain life. They are absolutely necessary. The book says that there are 72 spirits total, and there are also 72 spiritual arts corresponding to each of these spirits. There is one category for each race, including dwarves and goblins. These are different from the generic spirits that people use for everyday purposes. If there is a sufficient connection between a human and the spirits, then they may access the power of the original spirit of each category. The kind spirit that resides within Jack is named Andrea Lufus, granting him the ability wings of desertion, which allows him to make everything he touches weightless. She asks him not to be careless with his power. According to legend in the past, there was no distinction between heaven and earth. Everyone was free to go through the realms in between. However, as a result, due to the different languages and cultural differences gave rise to friction. Andrea Lufus, seeing the problems arising from this unrestricted movement, used invisible chains to bound humans to the earth. Jack, blessed and favored by Andrea Lufus, has the power to perceive these chains with a keen sixth sense. He breaks a chain bound on one of his wooden blocks, causing it to become weightless. He gently touches it, which causes it to fly forward and ricochet across the room. Jack ducks for cover just as Annie walks in to wake him up. The block continues to bounce around the room until it hits her in the left eye. For a brief second, Annie could have sworn that something had just hit her in the eye. Jack crawls over to her, picks up the floating piece, and deduces that weightless objects neither take nor deal any damage. Later while cooking, Annie leaves him unattended in a kitchen with an open fire while she retrieves some herbs from the warehouse. Left alone, Jack experiments with his ability. Just as he suspected, items he causes to float are rendered immune to any and all forms of physical damage, but immaterial effects like fire are still able to affect them. Thus, while Jack is floating, he is impervious to nearly all forms of injury, except for fire. He only has one thing left to test out. Since floating objects deal no damage, weight and mass are needed to inflict some pain. The wooden block that harmlessly hit Annie earlier was only ineffective, because he lost concentration at the last second. Back in his room, Jack continues to practice his powers on his wooden blocks to see the extent of his endurance. Kalan walks in on his son and sees that his powers have developed extraordinarily, and he couldn't be prouder. Jack is troubled that he was interrupted, but being coddled and praised like this isn't so bad. However, even with this peaceful life, the nightmare still comes back to haunt him. Back when his parents died, he had just graduated and entered high school. Ever since then, it was just him and his little sister living together. However, living with her was a nightmare. After preparing dinner one evening, Saya placed the food in her mouth and forcibly mouth-fed it to him. The experience was beyond disgusting. Unable to stomach and swallow the pre-chewed food, Jack spits it back out. Seeing that her brother wasted food, Saya threatens to punish him. Jack begs her not to, and he falls out of his chair. Saya drags in a woman bound in rope, her mouth taped shut. Her name is Reina, and she has committed a most grievous crime. Last year, on July 27, from 3.46.32 32 seconds to 56 seconds, she was caught staring at Jack for 24 seconds, like a dog in heat. It is unforgivable. Reina shakes her head as if to deny these allegations, but Saya has already judged her guilty. The crime of lying, obviously, is punishable by having her fingers sliced off. Reina, unable to scream, rolls around instead. Saya asserts that only she can fall in love with her brother, and it is Reina's own fault for glancing at him. She addresses the root of her sin, her eyes. She can't sin if she can't see. Saya dangles a corkscrew in front of her eyes. It's all because of her eyes that all this happened to begin with anyway. Jack tries to protest, but he knows that it is pointless. The more he resists, the more Saya will lash out at his friends and loved ones. Though his sister killed all those people, all he did was watch. Half the blame lies with him. Five years have passed, and nobody has come to save him. He hears a creaking sound coming from outside his door, so he decides to investigate. Though it should be impossible, the door is open when it should have been locked. Jack is finally free. He runs out into the neighborhood, laughing like a madman. He's finally escaped. Unfortunately, he hasn't finally escaped. Saya finds him almost immediately. Now that Jack has had his fun walking outside, she beckons for him to go back home with her. Jack is scared stiff for a moment, but he is tired of being helpless and not being able to do anything. 
Noticing a truck nearby, Jack runs up to her and pushes her into it. With this, he'll finally be free of her, or so he'd like to think. Saya grabs his arm and drags him down with her. They'll be together, even in death. Jack speedruns the stages of grief and lands on acceptance. At least this way, he won't have to deal with his sister ever again. Jack's first birthday is upon the Lieber household, and all his family and extended family have come to celebrate. Kalam can't wait to see his grandchild in his arms, but Madeline says that he might be skipping a few steps. Jack digs into his food, and Annie wipes a smudge off his face. Observing this, Madeline thanks Annie for taking care of Jack all this time, and she offers to give her some time off so she can see her own parents. Annie thanks her for the gesture, but there's no need. She doesn't find what she is doing to be work since Jack is very precious to her. Kalam congratulates his son. He can't even speak yet, but he's already seducing women. Madeline remarks that he might make girls cry in the future. Are his parents okay? Annie puffs out her chest and promises to keep an eye on him, so he doesn't get too crazy. The next day, Annie takes Jack out for a walk, but he is still half awake. While walking through the woods, Annie confides that she will be seeing her family the following day, though it has been a long time since she's actually seen them. Jack pats her face as if to tell her that everything will be okay. Annie smiles. The wind starts blowing on them, and Jack quickly becomes drowsy from the gentle breeze. Annie starts humming a tune, and Jack could have sworn he heard it before. One day before his parents died, Jack comes home from school and catches his sister making dinner. He notices her good mood from the tune she is humming, and she explains that the song is 10,000 feet in the Alps, though the lyrics are original. He asks her how there can be any lyrics if all she's doing is humming, and she promises to tell him the lyrics later. Later comes, though Jack wishes it hadn't. She starts singing the song right before she gouges out Rena's eye. How dare you make a pass at him? Now you won't see him again. Jack snaps back to his infant body, and he wonders why he remembered that song. He looks around and notices that they have deviated from their normal walking path. Annie continues singing that infernal song that his sister cooked up as they walk into a darker corner of the woods. Jack doesn't want to believe it, but he has to face the facts. He doesn't know why he didn't realize it sooner. Annie looks at Jack and asks him if he's awakened. She's waited 15 long years for him. Jack doesn't know how this could be possible. While Annie is pleased that Jack seems so surprised, she smirks. Just because Jack's name and face were changed when he was reincarnated, he thought she wouldn't be able to find her? How cute. How blissfully oblivious. Annie won't be stopped. Jack realizes that he has sorely underestimated his sister even though he was already plenty careful. Now Annie intends to live happily ever after with her adorable brother. There's no need for him to hide anymore. They'll be living in a new house, and Annie won't let anyone stand in the way of their new life together. Annie starts rambling about all the things they'll do together. Look at that. Look at all those dialogue boxes. Not even the combined might of Bob the Builder and Fix It Felix can fix her. Jesus Christ. Annie stares deep into Jack's eyes to make sure he gets the gist of the situation. There's nobody coming to help him now. Jack cannot speak, and he must scream. How many more years of his life will be stolen away by her? His mother, father, and everyone back at the house. He'll never see them again. Jack lets out a shrill cry, which temporarily stuns Annie. She loses her grip on him, and just before he hits the ground, Jack uses his wings of desertion to escape. Annie grits her teeth, and her face contorts into something monstrous. She won't let Jack get away. Jack manages to catch his breath in a small clearing. However, he knows that his options are limited. Even though he can escape and flee from the mansion, he knows that Annie will eventually return there and kill everyone. That's why, right here, right now, Jack has to beat her. But how can he? He's just a baby, and even when he was roughly the same age as her before, he was unable to do anything meaningful. He carelessly touches a rock, causing it to float into the air. He is reminded of the promise he made to himself when he first discovered that he had these powers. He was going to protect everyone with the wings of desertion, and that's what he intends to do. It's a fight to the death. He won't let her take anything away from him again. Annie arrives at the forest clearing while calling out for Jack. Jack is safely hidden away atop one of the trees. He still hasn't decided how to kill her. He could drop something on her head or make her float into the sky and cause her to fall. Annie calls out to Jack again, only this time she isn't messing around. She burns a tree with her fire-type spiritual arts, which soon spread to nearby trees. If he doesn't come out soon, she'll keep burning more trees to smoke him out. If he still stubbornly refuses to reveal himself, then she might just pay the mansion a visit. Jack didn't think that Annie's fire spiritual arts were this powerful. Jack flees from the burning woods to buy some time for him to think. He spots a rugged boulder, taps it, and sends it flying toward Annie. However, the boulder inexplicably stops just short of hitting her. 
which startles Jack. Annie launches herself at him, but he conducts some quick evasive maneuvers. Jack wonders how she was able to stop the rock, and he is afraid that she might have some version of Wings of Desertion as well. However, he knows that each person can only use a single spiritual art, so it must be something else. Suddenly, Jack halts in midair, and he can feel like he's stuck in something. Jack is completely helpless and is held in place. Powerful, near indestructible strings ensure that he isn't going anywhere. Annie approaches her dear brother, happy that they have been reunited again. Jack quickly realizes that he isn't bound by string but by hair. The same thing stopped his boulder attack earlier. Annie has channeled her spiritual energy into her hair, transforming them into powerful weapons. Jack was all wrong about Annie's Light of Dawn ability. Annie doesn't produce fire from her fingertips. Her entire body is one giant tinderbox, allowing her to spark a fire anywhere. She used her extended hair to set the trees alight, the same hair that she is now using to fight him. Annie retrieves Jack safely into her arms. Jack concedes that he has been caught and can no longer run away. However, Annie too has underestimated him. Jack isn't just able to make things weightless. He clenches his fist, causing a huge wind vacuum to suddenly appear. With wings of desertion, Jack stole the weight of the air. Though he'd normally have a hard time making something he can't touch weightless, the heated air makes it easier for him to feel it. Now that he has removed all the weight from the air, the pressure will drop, causing an air vacuum and an explosion. He can't wait to see how Annie will claw her way out of this one. As the stagnant air converges on Annie, her very body, the human tinderbox that it is, bursts into flames. Annie is burned alive, and her screams echo throughout the whole forest. Through sheer grit, Annie grabs her left hand and removes it from her body, causing an explosion that propels her and Jack away. Jack can't believe that she'd just blow up her own hand like that. Jack tries crawling away, but Annie and her stubby hand grab him. Jack looks at her face, and he almost throws up. Annie's body is half burnt, and her still smoldering flesh is exposed. Annie asks Jack if he's still willing to give his love to her even after she has been immolated beyond repair. Jack struggles to get away from Annie. All he has to do is take away her weight and fling her into the sky. But with the pressure and intensity that Annie is exuding, he is overwhelmed by a sense of dread. He remembers the lengths to which she went to make sure that he couldn't escape. He throws in the towel. He'll never escape from her. Annie looks down and sees that Jack has wet himself again. She readily helps clean him up. Jack closes his eyes. Everything is the same as before. Nothing has changed. His limbs are tied up, his willpower is subdued, and he is unable to lift a finger. The end result will be the same. These feelings of anxiety and dread paralyze his ability to act. Silence settles in, but then he begins to struggle again. Jack tries to shake off the chains binding him down. He reminds himself that he trained for three whole months precisely so he could beat Annie. These chains of fear that bind him down will be shattered with his own two hands and with a little bit of help. An iridescent feather falls from above, and it lands on Jack's stomach. It fills him with a potent, overwhelming power, and the chains around him begin to break. While Annie is cuddling Jack, she notices that something terrible is happening. The ground beneath her groans and trembles, and the ground opens up. After a terrible noise, the ground underneath them rises and they fall from it. Annie recognizes that this is no longer an ordinary spiritual art. The power is incomparable. Jack isn't just a spiritual arts user. He's a spiritual roost. Those who directly tap into the power of one of the 72 original spirits are called a roost. Only 72 such people can exist at any given time. Now standing before Jack is the original spirit that has blessed him with the power of the wings of desertion. It is the symbol of freedom and the 65th of the original spirits. The great blazing peacock, Andrea Lufus. Behold and bask in his brilliance. Annie admires Jack's magnificence and awe. He truly is someone worthy of her love. Just like German science, her brother is the best in the world. Jack looks down at his sister and tells her to die. All at once, Andrea Lufus shatters the chains binding the world together, causing unparalleled destruction. Surely that killed her once and for all, but for some reason he isn't too sure. He feels drops of water hit his head and looks to the sky, expecting to see rain. He thought it was rain, but it was Annie's barely alive body. She embraces Jack tightly, hoping to never separate from him again. This girl is insane. Jack looks down and realizes that she blasted off her own leg to propel her away from the cataclysm. She's so high up on the crazy scale that it's not even funny. With the force of the explosion still propelling her downward, Jack sees no point in trying to render her weightless. Trying to do so would only lead to his tiny, baby body being crushed. However, at this rate, he'll die regardless. He spots a small body of water and propels them toward it, and he hopes for the best. 
It's the only place he can stand a chance against a fire user like her. Jack climbs up from the falls and crawls up to dry rock. Things aren't looking good. In the end, he's still just a baby, and his body can't sustain this level of intense fighting. Annie starts walking toward him through the water. She knows that Jack propelled them here on purpose, and she praises her brother's tactical ingenuity. However, this isn't the only reason why Jack chose this location. There are many boulders that are perfect for hurling towards her. This time, Annie is at death's door, and she only has two good limbs to use. Dodging should be impossible for her at this range. Jack sends the rock forward to crush Annie, but she isn't worried. She does hate to have to do something this vulgar in front of him though. She spits forward, causing the boulder to combust. Jack is at his wit's end. If Annie can do just that with saliva, then he has no chance of winning. Annie's pokes her arms through the waterfall, and she is finally reunited with her brother. She has two faces, one overwhelmed by his cuteness, filled with passionate love, and the other filled with murderous intent toward anyone who so much as looks at him. Jack will stay by her side forever and ever. Suddenly, she notices that the water droplets in the air have been suspended, but she realizes it too late. Jack stole the weight of the waterfall while she was busy monologuing to herself. Because water continuously pours down from the waterfall, it would have been difficult to notice. Jack's attack with the rock was all to lure Annie into a false sense of security and make her think that he had run out of options. Jack has long reached his limits. Even the great Andrea Lufus lending his aid was all a stroke, but the fact that he dreamed up this plan while in an exhausted physical and mental state was the greatest miracle. Now that she is in this isolated spot with him, she will suffer a special guillotine that he has prepared for her. He's about to drop a metric ton of water on her, and she's going to like it. Annie tries to stop it, but in doing so, she lets her guard down again. Jack rips her finger and uses wings of desertion on her, causing her body to go weightless. However, when all is said and done, she's still her sister, and she was still the Annie who cared for him these past few months. He holds up the number three with his fingers. He'll give her three seconds to convince him to forgive her for all the atrocious things she's done. Annie goes on a feverish rant about how much she loves him more than anything else in the world and that she wants to stay by his side forever. Jack expected such an answer. It was because of that love that she stopped caring about anything else, including his own feelings, which led her down a dark path. It was because of that accursed love that all his friends and people close to him have miserably died at her hand. They didn't even know why they were killed. And all of this is because of her. Nothing can fix her now. She's incorrigible. A devil with human skin. He taps her on the forehead and draws the word cancelled over her body. Annie smiles, and her last words are I love you. Jack finishes her off with a punch, sending her crashing into the waterfall, where her body is crushed under the immense weight. Later, Jack flies out and sees her badly mangled body near the shallows. She's finally dead. He's finally killed her. This was his life's goal, but for some reason he doesn't feel fulfilled. Eventually, his family discovers him. Jack looks at his parents' faces, and he passes out from relief. His peaceful, wholesome life can now finally begin in earnest. The lights go dark. Annie makes a little oofsy face for being killed by a baby. She was just so happy that she lowered her guard, but there's nothing she can do. Regardless, she's satisfied by the results. She was able to talk to him after 20 long years, and it was so amazing that she bit her finger and wrote things with her own blood. Now that she's died, do you think that's the end of it? Next time, Annie will be a bit craftier with how she approaches loving her brother. You should know by now, dear reader, that death is never the end. Annie's soul will have to be claimed by hell itself before she lets something as trivial as death stop her. The game is just beginning. One day, Jack and Saya are introduced to the daughter of their neighbor. Satho introduces himself, but Saya is incredibly shy and struggles to say her name. All she can do is whisper. The girl finds Saya's shyness endearing, and she's happy to meet her too. But before she can introduce herself, Jack's memories go dark. Nearly a decade has passed since Jack's fateful battle with Annie, and the summer heat is beating down on him despite the shade. Now seven years old, Jack has been training extremely hard in order to master his power, the wings of desertion. His current training goal is to jump into the air. It turns out his ability isn't flying per se, but floating. By carefully harnessing his power, he can make it so that he can temporarily turn the air into a platform of sorts to propel him higher and faster. Unfortunately, it's easier said than done. His current limit is two air jumps. Most spiritual arts users are considered prodigies at 10 years old and geniuses at 15. For Jack to be able to do this at seven means that he defies all available categories. His next goal is to get himself admitted to the Royal Academy of Spiritual Arts in the capital, the most prestigious school in the country. Being a graduate of this school will give him the influence he needs to eventually inherit his father's territory. 
Kalam picks him up and brings him to meet with Cherno, the chairman of the Pulsford company. Cherno is absolutely delighted by Jack's insight and maturity. Kalam boasts that Jack has always been this advanced. Cherno explains that he also brought his daughter, Philene, along for the trip. He had hoped to introduce her to them, but she disappeared the moment he took his eyes off her. Jack volunteers to search for her on the mansion grounds, and he excuses himself from the room. Jack starts wondering where he should start looking because she definitely isn't in the mansion. Madeline catches him leading a few guests inside the house, and she knows all about his little task to look for Philene. She tells him to be careful and not to wander too far from the mansion. It is a rare thing for Madeline to have guests over, and Jack wonders how she knows them. Jack painstakingly combs through the mansion grounds in search of Philene, but all he finds is a rabbit. He sees a hole in the fence and climbs through it. While searching the nearby woods, he hears something falling from above. Philene nearly lands right on top of him, but he uses wings of desertion to cushion her fall. Philene has fun floating midair, and he tries to warn her not to move too much since it might cause her to fall. Philene falls, but she's okay. Jack introduces himself as the son of the Lieber family, and he went out looking for her because she wasn't in the mansion. He tells her that it is dangerous to be wandering around the forest alone, but she doesn't share his fears. Jack forgets that not all seven-year-olds are like him. Phelan drags Jack around the forest so they can play together, but before he can protest, he is overwhelmed by a nostalgic feeling. Smooth, chestnut hair, a peppy, energetic spirit. Phelan reminds Jack of his childhood friend. They're almost the spitting image of each other. Phelan struggles to pronounce Jack's name properly, but she gets there eventually. She shortens it to Ja though. She asks him to call her Phil, since that's what everyone else calls her. Jack asks if they can go back to the mansion already, but Feline is too busy frolicking in a grassy field. She runs headfirst, but she ends up tripping on something. As Jack rushes to check on her, they discover that she tripped over a body. Jack is afraid that it is a corpse, but as he moves to inspect the body, it suddenly twitches. Jack notices that the body seems to be that of an elf. Filing runs away almost instantly, leaving Jack alone with the woman. The elf says that she's hungry, and she flops onto Jack, chest first. Jack was seven years old. It was the height of summer, though he couldn't hear any cicadas. On that day, Jack met Filling and a big-chested elf, and what a meeting it was. They lead the elf back to their house, where she devours their whole stock of food in the blink of an eye. They can't even complain about it. They're actually damn impressed by her appetite. Madeline asks the elf more about herself, and after clearing her throat, the elf introduces herself as Raquel. She left on a journey some time ago, but she forgot to account for food. Filene asks her why she's traveling, and Rekel explains that she's trying to collect some spiritual arts. When they ask her what she means by that, she deems it easier to show rather than tell. First she ignites a fire using the light of dawn in her right hand, and next she conjures a small water ball using the ocean's hand in her left. Kalam is shocked. What she is doing shouldn't be possible, but Rekel says that it is, thanks to her unique art, plunderer of God's will, which is governed by the great spirit, Spax, who presides over theft. Kalam asks her if this allows her to take other people's arts, but she says that it is more accurate to say that she imitates them. Even Jack finds it hard to digest this information. She explains that after identifying a specific spiritual art, she is able to copy it by watching the original user use it. However, the caveat is that she can only store two spiritual arts at a time. Kalam asks her if she means to learn multiple spiritual arts this way, and she confides that this is just a part of it. She hopes that by learning multiple arts, she might be able to find something she needs one day. Feline asks how long she's been traveling, and Feline replies that she's been at it for over 80 years. That's a near immortal elf for you. Jack asks her if she has knowledge of the wings of desertion, and she says that she does. She is quite familiar with how it works. When Kalan learns that she has no concrete short-term goals, he invites her to stay at the house for a while. In exchange, he asks that she teach Jack how to use his spiritual arts. Jack seems a bit bothered by how suddenly Kalam invited her to stay, but Kalam believes this is a good chance to learn. Elves are long-lived and have troves of experience. Above all else, she's a cute girl. Madeline looks at her husband sweetly and asks him to repeat what he just said. Kalam swears it was just a joke. Rickel doesn't agree right away. She at least liked to see the level Jack is at right now. Jack smiles. If there's one thing he loves, it's showing off. Outside, Jack causes a massive boulder to go weightless, and he lifts it above his head. Rekol is impressed. For a child, Jack is quite the specimen, and she guesses that he must be the roost of Andrea Lufus. Many of Jack's tutors gave up when they saw the level he was at, and now he waits to see how Rekel will react. Rekel finds him to be a promising pupil. 
As a special treat, she shows him a multi-layered air jump at speeds that his eyes can't keep up with. She has a feeling that Jack can't do what she can. She pulls him out of the air, causing him to lose focus and drop the boulder. She whispers into his ear that he might be a genius when it comes to raw output, but he doesn't have the technique to make use of it. Rickle teases Jack, forcing him to ask politely to be let down. Jack calls her master, and she lets him go. She once again introduces herself as Raquel, and from now on she will be his master and teacher. This new encounter is yet another path through life. However, as his hand grows closer to hers, he suddenly gets another terrible feeling. It's as if his sister's essence is still lingering in this world, and things are going according to her plan. It remains to be seen how Raquel fits into all this.